everybody. Greetings from sunny Minneapolis, where it is just as cold and snowy as it would be in Boston if we were all in the same place. Welcome to the SIGHONC Ask Us Anything panel at KubeCon North America 2020 virtual. Um, SIGHONC is not an official Kubernetes special interest group. We are a hacker crew and a group of friends who have been working on various aspects of Kubernetes security for a long time now, and we're super excited to be here. These questions have been brought to us by the community, and thank you all for submitting them. So. Thanks for being here with us. Uh, let's introduce ourselves. My name is Ian Coldwater. I come from a DevOps turned pen testing background. I am now the co-chair of Kubernetes SIG security and the new director of DevSecOps at Twilio. I've been hacking on Kubernetes things for about four years now, and I'm super excited to be here. Hey everyone, my name is Duffy Cooley <clears throat> and uh, my pronouns are he, him. I've been playing with networks, distributed systems, and people in this space for quite a while. Um, and I really enjoy making in, uh, um, communities like Kubernetes like more approachable and, and certainly more inclusive. So uh, if you have any questions or anything I can do, ever do to help, just reach out. I'm happy to do it. I've recently transitioned to Apple, and, uh, and now I'm doing some of that work there. So I'm really excited to be here. Oh, my pronouns are they, them too. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So my name is Rory McKeon. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I'm a principal consultant at NCC Group, uh, where I focus mainly on doing security tests and assessments for customers. And I've been looking at container security now for about four or five years. And I'm Brad Giesman. My pronouns are he, him. And I'm the co-founder of Darkbit, a consultancy focused on cloud and Kubernetes security posture assessments. And I've been building and hacking on Kubernetes for almost four years now as well. And yes, Giesman is my real last name, but it's no coincidence that I was pretty much born to honk. Speaking of that, though, I suppose we, we should explain what all the honking is about. So the honk thing came from a video game called Untitled Goose Game, which was published by a company called House House about a year ago. In Untitled Goose Game, the protagonist is a mischievous goose who runs around a pastoral English village causing trouble on purpose. Um, this goose in this game um, kind of sneaks around and uses uh, seemingly innocuous everyday objects to uh, chain them together to perhaps do something like exploit them for its own ends. Because of this, because it's kind of like the way hackers do things, some of us hackers kind of adopted this goose as a mascot of sorts. And when we talk about honking, a lot of the time we'll talk about hacking or just causing problems on purpose. <laughs> I have a question for you all. So we've all been working on Kubernetes for a minute. How do you think that the security posture and attack surface has changed with more modern cloud native tech stacks over the old way of doing things? That's a great question. I think, you know, in my mind, the old way was when we would rack up a thousand servers or start up a bunch of virtual machines, and then we would leverage tools to deploy some subset of our application to a subset of those nodes, right? And, and, and with that old way, we had all kinds of interesting challenges like you know, shared libraries and other problems that would, that would be inherent when we were trying to couple different applications onto particular nodes. Um, and the new way, we, we're dealing with container orchestration, right? We're dealing with a, a, a very similar model in which we're dropping applications onto some subset of those nodes or running them as long time or long running processes just like we did before. Um, but the difference is that now, um, you know, where some of the benefits of this new security model come, in, come into play is that now we're actually giving each of those running processes their own view of the network, their own view of the file system, their own view of the PID namespace. And these things mean that we actually have better isolation between processes because we can actually uh, containerize them. This is effectively what containerizing is. It's basically just giving that running process its own isolated view of the world. And so I do think that that has improved security, but it hasn't changed it too much as we look at the way that those processes interact with the kernel. Yeah, I think for me, one of the big things about moving to, to Kubernetes and cloud native has been this move to automation. It's been this process of everything being you know, automated and, and infrastructure as code. And that's kind of got trade-offs. It's got good things for security and it's got some things that are challenges. So the good things for me, one of the big ones is about repeatability. This idea that, you know, I can take this code and I can create, you know, 10, 20, 30 environments. And for me as a security tester, it means that I can say, hey, spin me up a new environment just for my test. And I can be confident that my findings, you know, they're going to be relevant and the same ones as you're going to see in production. So that's great. 
But the downside is that we have to think about things differently now. So we don't have pet servers anymore. We can't just load all our secrets up manually. We have to work out how we're going to store them and how we're going to manage them securely. And that's one of the problems, the newer problems that we have to think about. And also with everything being in the cloud, you know, we have to think, well, everything's exposed. Everything's one step away from being compromised. So we have to be really careful with how we manage our information and access to things because it's all out there just sitting on the cloud. Yeah. And I, I think there are a lot of benefits. I mean, the move to API driven infrastructure and configuration means that there's, you know, many more opportunities to bake security improvements into the code that is the source of truth as opposed to say only being able to bolt it on later. And those same APIs make it much easier to query about those security settings at scale. One, you know, one place you query everything and you can see what the actual answer is. So like if a security policy or a misconfiguration is present, it's probably present everywhere. That makes it much easier to fix because it's all in a central spot and you can have it reliably take effect on the whole fleet. And that brings a lot less overall toil. But I think the challenge is, is finding that balance of velocity on automation uh, versus complexity and security. So another question that we got asked is, what do we think developers of upstream and downstream cloud native technologies should be thinking about from a security perspective? So as you all said a minute ago, I mean, it's important to just note in general for people who are building this kind of infrastructure that what's old is new again. Um, you know, that a lot of these problems of like the old tech that the shiny cloud native wrapper is around haven't really quite been solved yet. So keep an eye on those. But also you can't just assume that everything is the same. So keep an eye on that too. If you're building your first party data center in the cloud, it's probably going to be very expensive and not work exactly the way you think it will. But also in general, when you're looking at the systems that you're building, um, I think it's really important to look at it from the perspective of an attacker. Because as an attacker, I'm going to be looking at your systems and I'm going to be looking at them in perhaps a different way than you might. Do you actually know what's running in your environment? Do you actually know exactly what your code does? And if you do know what your code does, are you including the perspective of an attacker persona in your user personas if you use those? Because when I'm looking at a system, I'm looking at it for things like, where are the holes in this? Where are the trust boundaries? Is there anything that is going to take unexpected input and do anything weird with it? So if you look at the systems that you're building, both upstream and downstream, when you're building them and think about how an attacker might look at them and what that perspective might look like, that can be really valuable and threat model accordingly because having a threat model is really important. Yeah, I like that. And I, and I will paraphrase another friend who says that um, one of the ways to think about um, you know, increasing the security of your, of your application or your environment is to think about what tools you might be leaving behind for those attackers. Um, and, and one of the ways that I conceptualize this is by thinking about like what is packaged inside of a container image, right? That, can, that whole container image is gonna ship and it's gonna be running and it's gonna be exposed to that long running process on those nodes that we were talking about earlier, right? And that means that anything that's inside of that container image will be available if somebody were to get a reverse shell on that node. Now right. I understand like the incredible power of having a debugging tool or bash or at, you know, SCP or any of these amazing tools that you could use to actually like get logs off of the running you know, or out of a container or understand what's happening with a particular process or debugging things. But at the same time, and, and many people actually will bundle these things into their container image because it might become in handy later. But at the same time, it may not come in handy for you and it may come, hand, come in handy for anybody, like even people who have or are working for nefarious purposes. The other thing I think that is useful is um, thinking about these new contain, you know, this container orchestration model. We have to think about like, you know, what privilege has been granted to that process, right? Like, is it running as a privileged container? Can it see all of the PIDs in the host namespace? Is it able to manipulate network interfaces? Is it able to do things like this? And there's a ton of sharp edges and configurability in this, especially with regard to things like Kubernetes. But yeah. You know, what tools have you left behind? What, what have you left behind for your attackers is a great way to think about this. Another great question that came up for us was, how do you go about evaluating the attack surface uh, of a cluster and actually attacking it? Like where, where do you even begin? Yeah, that's, that's a really good one. So for me, a lot of what I do focuses on things from a configuration standpoint. So I'll first look at the configuration of the external network and how access to the control plane and the nodes are configured. 
then I'll kind of work my way in and I'll look at the configuration of the surrounding cloud environment, like say how the cluster is situated and what access it has to other things. And then I'm thinking about like the API server and just ruling out the obvious RBAC flaws like anonymous secrets to you know access to secrets or if there's any applicable CVEs and things like that. And then sort of like stepping in further, kind of like layers of the onion, I look at the configuration of the Kubernetes components, the cloud credentials that are attached to the worker nodes, and then sort of as a unit, uh, the combination of RBAC, admission control, network access control, and container image contents, kind of all as one thing to say, you know, what's the overall security posture of that given workload? And then I'll sort of step back and work through some what if scenarios for like the common types of attacks against like the cluster from the outside or what services are exposed. And then sort of take the, what happens if this container inside the cluster is compromised and look at it from that perspective. Yeah, I think that, that ties in a lot of with what we end up doing. I think when we end up doing security assessments for customers, what we typically do is we'll take one of two approaches, you know, We'll either take this white box approach where we can give an access, you know, we're given access to configs, we're given access to pull stuff down. And there, a lot of what turns out to be happening is we end up doing data analysis, pulling large quantities of JSON down and parsing it and, and looking for patterns. You know, you've got a lot of data to look at. Automation and parsing is really important. And you're looking for patterns that could indicate problems. So it could be cluster admin, you know, uh, this, this process runs as cluster admin, that's going to be dangerous. And it's also going to be a target for me or other attackers. What about privileged containers? You know, as Duffy said before, privileged containers can see all the processes. They can get a lot of more access. So what's in there that might be running as privileged? But then when we're doing the black box, what we're doing is really trying to take that scenario and say, hey, you know, hey, I am a compromised container. You know, I've got access to this container. What can I do? Can I break out to the sandbox? What rights do I have? Do I maybe have a Docker socket mounted inside my container? And maybe where can I go on the network? So there's these two approaches, but you're looking for the same kind of things. You're looking for patterns of badness. Yeah, totally what they said, um, you know, you want to look at like what exactly is going on in the environment that you're assessing, like what's running in there, how is it running, what level of privilege does it have, is there anything that is potentially exploitable. And then if you can get that, then you kind of see how far you can go, can you break out of the container, can you break out of the node, can you break out of the cluster itself and go into the cloud. It's really going to vary depending on what you find, but it's really a matter of like figuring out what's going on, seeing how far you can get. And a lot of it, as y'all said, is pattern recognition. Yeah. But I want to note that if people are watching this who are new to this, I don't want the idea of us using a lot of pattern recognition to be discouraging to you because this isn't magic. It isn't that we're like wizards who have arcane knowledge that can't be gained by other people. It's just that we've had a lot of practice and that's something that you can learn in practice too. And for people who are excited about learning how to attack Kubernetes and this kind of thing, I want to encourage you to get your hands dirty, go in and start practicing how to do that yourself. Um, a couple of great resources to do that are, uh, there's a workshop that happened um, at KubeCon NA last year by Brad and some other awesome folks. Um, you can find it at securekubernetes.com. It holds up very well with time and you can go all the way through it. There's also a CTF that happens periodically called Honk CTL. At one point we played it as a team and it was pretty great and I believe that we won it. Um, and uh, so that's something to look out for. And in general, playing capture the flag games like CTFs, not the kind of capture the flag that you played on the playground when you were a kid, but the kind that's like getting to like learn how to hack and sharpen your skills and learn how to think like an attacker is something I really recommend that people do because it can be useful and it's also fun. Definitely. Um, while we're on the subject of pattern recognition, another question that we got that I'm gonna throw to you all is, if somebody is a defender or a cluster administrator, what are some indicators that um, a cluster or a Kubernetes environment has been compromised that people should look out for? If there's a breach, is there something that people can see that happened? Yeah, you know, going back to uh, the answer about like how the Kubernetes security surface has changed, I think it, it actually highlights, you know, some of the complexity that we've introduced in this process as well. So let's think about like the old way and the new way and, and, and glue these things together. So the old way, we would have, you know, a subset of our applications running on a subset of nodes and we might configure something like audit D to watch for behavior that we thought was, no, was not normal, right? And, and alert on that. And then that would give us the ability to kind of understand that things were happening in our systems that, we're not, that we were not expecting. Uh, something you might not be expecting is something uh, modifying or opening the, the file Etsy password 
right? Or the shadow file or any, or other like secure, you know, or things that you would expect that uh, not an, an application that would not do during normal uh, experience. Well, now in this new system, as we, as we describe, as we explore containerization, we have n number of Etsy password files, right? Because each process sees its own file system, right? And so that definitely adds a bit of complexity to the problem because now we actually have to understand, you know, which password file was attacked or was, was uh, touched and which container was it running? And is that still not normal or is that okay? Right, but understanding that normal behavior and like uh, and understanding how to de 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 to detect it um, has changed. We can't just watch all of the file systems. We have to change the way we're watching for those things. There's a great project in the CNCF umbrella called um, Falco, and Falco basically operates at the syscall interface, and so it's watching for um, system calls like file open or, or grabbing a file handle on Etsy password against the, the Linux kernel. And then maintaining the context so that you can understand which container this happened in and maintaining the context so you can understand which container opened that network socket and, and really provides like a, a, a great next generation audit capability. So that's definitely how I would start. Yeah, I'll echo what Duffy said about, you know, getting visibility into what's happening inside the containers for that malicious activity is like the primary source. Like, somebody could control exec or a shell was spawned, you know, file connection, like Duffy said, those are like great primary indicators. Um, I think the next best place to be looking are the audit logs. So, you know, the API server audit logs and the neighboring cloud API audit logs are really key in terms of getting that clear smoking gun evidence. And while it might not be the first thing that captures the, the compromise, it's probably going to capture a lot of the next steps that the attacker will take because they will yep. most likely find valid credentials somewhere and try those credentials against those APIs as they say, you know, can I expand my access uh, inside the cluster or the privilege escalate or try to escape out into the node or escape out into the neighboring cloud environment. So for me, I think, you know, the one, two punch is, is malicious activity detection logs and the audit logs in combination so you can really understand what just happened. So hopefully security incidents like that will continue to be relatively uncommon. Uh, but one of the questions that might be helpful for cluster administrators to know more about is, you know, how do you go about evaluating a project for its overall security posture before you take the time to install it and integrate it into your own environment? Like what things are you looking for? And that I'll throw that over to you guys. Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think obviously there are a huge number of projects in this space. So it's one you're going to have to spend some time on. The first place I would probably look is, you know, the CNCF security audit reports. You know, every graduated project has got an audit report done by a third party. And those are great resources, not just for like looking at code bugs, but also for looking at how the project, you know, how what its security posture is like. So that's a good starting point. I'll also tend to look at the websites, you know, for each project and say, do you have security contact information? You know, do you, are you encouraging security people to get in touch and to actually like get involved with the project? And then the other place I tend to look is what's the happy path install like? You know, what are the defaults that this project uses? Are they going to give you a secure installation? Because that's that tends to be a good indicator as well. For me, I want to know how exactly the thing works. Like technically, what are the details of like, what exactly is it doing in there? What kind of privilege does it ask for? What kind of access does it need? Does it have read write access to the host, to other machines? Like as an attacker, I know how I would want to potentially use something to break out of it. How viable is that? And in general, if I'm using it if I'm thinking about using it in my environment, how does it fit into my environment? What does it require to be connected to? Does it conflict with anything? And um, you know, what does it talk to? And how does it fit into my threat model? Because it's really important, as I said earlier, to threat model your environment, figure out what's in there, figure out what's important to you, and see if that project is going to fit into that larger goal. So I have a question for you all. Um, speaking of larger goals, how do you find inspiration for where to honk next? And how do you develop intuition about the emergent behavior of complex systems? I really like this question. I think it's fun. Yeah, it's a great question. I, for my part, I think it's, um, I, I really maintain curiosity about everything, uh, every, everything around me all the time. Like I'm, I'm, total, I'm definitely one of those uh, question everything types of people. Um, 
And I find that that's uh, true, not just in the way that I evaluate software or the way I evaluate systems, but generally in life. Like I would look at an elevator and realize I'm going to be on this elevator, you know, for 20 minutes of my day every day. So I wonder what else I can learn about this elevator, right? And might do some research on the type of elevator it is and see if there are any like, you know, secret button pushes or tricks to actually <laughs> opt to change the behavior of this elevator um, in, to my benefit, right? Like. Uh, and so for my part, it's definitely curiosity, stay curious, you know, like under, you know, take the time to explore that curiosity. And I know that we can all feel very rushed when we're doing our day-to-day -day job, but like that curiosity in you should be celebrated and, and, you know, take some time to maintain that. Absolutely. I think curiosity is a, a big part of it. And for me, like some of the best places I get a, a kind of inspiration is from trying to answer people's questions. You know, seeing someone ask me a double question, go, that's a good point. How does that work? So one of the things I do is I do a training course on container security and definitely some of my best inspiration has come from a question on that course saying, hey, how does that work? I go, oh, and that leads me down a path. And you know, there's other places, good places as well. You know, you can go to Stack Overflow or Security Stack Exchange and try and answer the questions. And doing that will lead you to interesting places, could even lead to CVEs. The other one I, I like personally is, is uh, I go to GitHub Issues, right? I go to the Kubernetes Issues list, filter by security. Just start reading the issues and finding out what people are thinking about security. And again, that can lead to interesting places or even CVEs. I'm also a big fan of reading GitHub issues and not just in the Kubernetes repository. Um, various kinds of dependencies, different kinds of third party components can have interesting questions that are posited there too. Because not every bug necessarily looks like a security bug, but often other bugs can be security bugs. So sometimes if you read between the lines in different kinds of issues of people being like, I found this weird problem, what's up with that? Sometimes you can find interesting things there. I also really enjoyed reading the docs. Um, a lot of project documentation can have interesting phrases in it, like this can provoke unexpected behavior. Do not use this in production. Please make sure to change these insecure defaults and things like that, that when I see that, I'm like, that's interesting. What does this mean? And then I want to go chase it and poke at it. Inspiration can be found from all kinds of places. And personally, I'm excited about that unexpected behavior and those intersections and corner cases of like what you don't think you're going to find, but do. So those are a lot of the time, the things that I look for. Yeah, uh, curiosity, definitely. Um, I'm fortunate in that I always get to see a fair, a number of different setups. And there's always something I haven't seen before. So I like to use that opportunity to get my hands on it. I have to you know, see it running, get it working, and then sort of take survey of what it needs and the assumptions and design decisions that were made, especially around those defaults. But I don't like stopping there. Uh, you know, that might be you know, job done, but that's where I think the fun just starts. So I go right at poking and prodding. I'm trying to knock it over, mess with its inputs, and really see how it handles things when I'm really giving it uh, uh, things that it wasn't expecting. So all the time I'm asking, what if I do this? What if I do that? What if I give it that? Too much, too little. What if I take that out? Like what behavior emerges? So like a few months ago, I was poking at a container image manifest. I was just taking out the digest or like modifying the URL to fetch a layer from somewhere else. And that just ended up triggering a CVE uh, in a container runtime. So. You know, things like that that just kind of pop out of that emergent behavior is really where I like to, to dive in and get my hands dirty on. Okay. So we all have unique takes on how we find new things, but like what's an area that you all think is ripe for further hacking and exploitation? Yeah, you know, I think going back to like how we're changing things, you know, like how things are changed under contain container orchestration, there is a ton of space that we haven't really spent a ton of time with yet, right? Um, as we think about the way that we're building that isolation model, you know, giving each process its own network namespace or file system, those sorts of things, this is actually implemented by container runtimes. And there are several popular container runtimes. And that makes you wonder, like, are they all operating the same? Were they all designed with the same set of assumptions? I, I think that there's like a, a pretty rich space in, in, in those sorts of assumptions. Um, also, uh, things like system calls, right? Like I was talking about earlier with Falco watching at the syscall layer to understand what's happening. Well, the mapping of syscalls is different on the based on the architecture that you use. So it would be different for x86-64 than it would be for ARM. And, and I do think that like 
you know, in those models where we like make the assumption that perhaps we're just, we should be only operating under the map that's under x86, x86 64, but this is now running on ARM. So is it, you know, are we still, are we seeing a difference in behavior? So those sorts of assumptions, I think really definitely highlight, you know, a whole field of area to play with. I, th I think for me, it is all about these layers and all the different assumptions that are being built up as we stack over more and more layers, you know, from the kernel up through Docker, through Kubernetes, into things like service mesh. And it, where those layers meet, you get these kind of possibilities for weird sharp edges, corner cases, stuff that could be odd. And we're implementing a lot of protocols that are historically complicated. Things like HTTP, there have been security bugs in HTTP servers for decades now, and also PKI. You know, Kubernetes makes a lot of use of PKI. It's traditionally a complex thing that has had a lot of security issues. So those are the kind of areas I think are good. In particular, I think where we ever see a new layer. So every new layer has a time to settle down and to work out what security looks like. So at the moment, something like operators, you know, it's quite a new thing. Uh, it's, there's a lot of activity there, there's a lot of development. So there's probably going to be opportunities to, you know, to poke at it some more. And it's an area I think I'm probably going to be more interested, you know, over the next 12 months or so. Yeah, for me, I've noticed you know, a growing number of projects that are extending the Kubernetes API with custom resources. And that's to do things like create more clusters and even as like a new abstraction for managing other cloud resources. And I think anytime you give the data plane of one environment enough access and permissions to be the control plane of another environment, I think that's where things can really get interesting uh, when those, those layers intersect. For sure. And yeah, continuing the ongoing theme of layers, you know, container security is a holistic thing, right? Your container security is only as good as the security of the rest of your stack. And for me, thinking about the way that the different parts of the stack interact present a lot of exciting, often unexplored attack surface. I'm really excited about hardware attacks. Um, I think microarchitectural attacks are really interesting, like Meltdown Inspector and their variants. <laughs> And I think that there is a lot of unexplored territory about how that can interact with things like multi-tenancy in the cloud. Um, I'm also really excited, one layer above, um, about eBPF as an attack surface. I think that that is a very interesting unexplored territory where there's a lot of fun things that we haven't quite done yet. So I feel excited about exploring that coming up and, and just getting to explore all of the things, because I think the cloud native space in general is so new. We're all exploring and building this stuff together. There's parts of the attack surface we don't even know are there yet, perhaps because it hasn't been invented. So I'm super excited to be here at KubeCon Cloud NativeCon with everybody getting to build this future together and these technologies together. And I want to say thank you to all of you for being here and building and exploring these futures with us. Um, if you want to be further involved in the Kubernetes project or the security of it, there's lots of work in Kubernetes to do um, and in the CNCF landscape in general. Uh, Kubernetes and a lot of these projects are open source. There's lots of work to be done, um, lots of interesting problems to solve. If you want to get involved, Kubernetes has lots of special interest groups, um, SIGs that do lots of different kinds of work. I'm the co-chair of SIG Security. Um, we have lots of interesting problems to solve and we would love for you to get further involved if you're interested. If you want to ask us questions or talk to us further, we're around. You can find us on Kubernetes Slack or discuss.kas.io. And we would love to be able to talk to you all and learn with you together. Indeed. Um, and I also wanted to highlight again that like a lot of the questions that we answered during this AMA panel came from the community. And I wanted to give a shout out to everybody in the community who took the time to ask us a question for this panel. We could not do this without your help. So thank you so much for, for putting up questions. And one more thing. Hog the, the planet. Hog the planet. Thank you.